Sound Rendered on IKTV. I'm Tony Regisford, and my guest is Professor Hilary Beckles. Professor Beckles, welcome to Simmons and the Grandines, and welcome to the studios of IKTV. Uh, thank you, Tony. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here in your program and to uh, participate in the conversation. And always wonderful to be in St. Vincent. Well, I'm, I was going to say that I'm sure that it's not your first time here by any stretch of the imagination. Well, you know, um, rumor has it in my family that I mm. was conceived in St. Vincent. <laughs> 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 but I've, I've been coming here uh, over the past 30 years, uh, at least four or five times a year. So yeah. I, I know it quite well. And needless to say, you are a bona fide son of the Caribbean soil. Yes. So let's get straight into it. The, you, you've authored many pieces, and um, your latest piece of work is this Britain's Black Debt. And it is a making a case for reparations. And reparations is quite a topical issue right now. It's been um, raised by our current prime minister, um, and he's been criticized for it, and also the, you know, the, the naysayers, the pros and cons about what he's talking about. So it's, it's a very appropriate topic. So let's, let's get straight into it. Now, we're dealing with slavery as practiced by the British. Before we get into that, tell me how did the British briefly put themselves in a position of dominance in this Caribbean uh, um, archipelago? Well, as you know, um, in the hundred years after Columbus mm. uh, came into this region and established slavery and uh, imperial systems, the British were able to make some very strategic decisions about investing in the, in the Lesser Antilles. Mm -hmm. As you know, the, the, the Spanish had consolidated their situation in the Greater Antilles. Uh, the English took the small islands that the Spanish seemed to have had little interest in. No gold, right. no major agricultural potential. Right. So those would be like Barbados, St. Kitts, St. Kitts, the Leeward Islands, the Leeward Islands, the Leeward islands right. especially. Effectively, Barbados and the Leeward Islands. Right. The windwards, they couldn't make a stronghold because the Carib community, the indigenous people, had a military stronghold. They were defending the windward so islands. There was a history of resistance. There. there was a history of resistance from the native people, and therefore mm -hmm. they couldn't make the breakthrough in the windward islands. But they were able to make the breakthrough in Barbados and in the leewards. Now, they were able, of course, to establish uh, effective military control of some of these islands so that when the sugar industry came into the Eastern Caribbean in the middle of the 17th century, the British found themselves with a market advantage because at that moment, Brazil was the world's greatest producer of cane sugar. Right. Tremendous demand for cane sugar on the global market. But Brazil goes into civil war because effectively it was a Portuguese colony. Mm -hmm. The Dutch had invested in the sugar industry and felt they had a claim to more political authority. So civil war broke out in Brazil, which was the world's largest producer of cane sugar. Right. So that destabilized their supply. And for 10 years, yes. the sugar industry of the world was in chaos. Mm -hmm. The British saw the opportunity to move in and develop a sugar industry in Barbados, in Antigua, and St. Kitts. And from that base, develop a very aggressive slave system. That was the beginning of this entire process. Now, in the introduction to your book, which is what we're talking about here, you say, despite political intimidation in the West, in, in the, West the majority of Caribbean citizens believe that there's a case to be answered by the British state in respect to crimes against humanity committed during the slave regime and the century of racial apartheid that followed. Now, tell me, what constitutes a legitimate claim for crimes against humanity? Well, international law is uh, very explicit on what are crimes against humanity. To reduce people to a status of slavery mm -hmm. is a crime against humanity. To deny people their human identity and their human rights by having them classified in law as property as real estate, to deny them their individuality as a human being is a crime against humanity. To traffic in persons against their will is a crime against humanity. To create a culture where people are prostituted against their will, such as what they have done to the black women of the Caribbean, that is a crime against humanity. So the slavery system 
from the trafficking, from the buying and selling, from the, the reduction of millions of people to a non-human status and to classify them in law as property and real estate, through to the prostitution of the enslaved women of the Caribbean. All of those really constitute a structure of a series of crimes. And these crimes on the international law must be addressed and must be answered. And I think across the world, all such cases have been addressed. The Caribbean is the only part of the world that has not yet systematically addressed these matters. Well, as you, in, in, in as much as you brought that up, you're saying there's precedent for you know, these cases that have been answered for crimes against humanity. Can you tell me, at least, you know, give me two examples of where nations have been made, or a state has been made to settle disenfranchised people as a result of the crimes that was historically committed uh, yes. against them? Well, first of all, let me say that for the last hundred years, mm -hmm. many countries in the former colonized world have been bringing cases for reparations. They have not generally succeeded. If you take, for example, uh, in the Caribbean, the Rastafarian community has been put in this case for 40 years now. Yes. For, so in other words, the cases have been ongoing, but the cases have not been answered. And the reason why the cases have not been answered is that reparations is never, ever, ever achieved by weak nations. They are never achieved by weak, disorganized communities. Only highly organized nations, only nations with a resolve, only highly disciplined peoples actually win reparations. Mm -hmm. Let me give you two cases of this. During um, the Korean War, uh, the Japanese uh, moved into Korea and brought women from the villages and so on into the army camps and used them as sex slaves. It was only recently that mm -hmm. the people of Korea have found the organizational fortitude right. to bring that case into the international Japan. court against Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan has settled that matter and has paid millions of yen into a fund for the rehabilitation of those people who are the descendants of, of these victims. The Maori people of New Zealand, the indigenous people of New Zealand, the, their government has finally found the courage to bring the case against Britain. Britain has answered it, has paid reparations to the Maori people. Recently, we've had cases in the US where indigenous peoples have received reparations for the loss of their land, the appropriation of their properties, for their imprisonment during the Second World War. Right. So across the world, you have seen these cases coming and going. But this is the first time that the Caribbean is now mobilizing itself to fall within the international pattern, which is to say, we have some issues that must be addressed, they must be discussed, and they must be settled. Now, I'm going to refer to your, your book here again, because you, you talk about uh, Mari Matsuda mm -hmm. and the three well, criteria that, that was proffered here as criteria that you must meet in order to bring a legitimate case for reparations. Uh, the injustice must be well documented and data setting out the specifics of the injustice should withstand, and withstand scientific scrutiny and be verifiable to the satisfaction of the court or tribunal. Okay. The victims must be identifiable as a distinct group. The current members of the group must continue to suffer harm. Now, based on those three criteria, how does the Caribbean case for reparations match up to that? The Caribbean case uh, on the international law is mm -hmm. a very, very strong case indeed. All of the criteria necessary to bring this matter before for international arbitration are there. The documentation surrounding the enslavement of African peoples and native people of the Caribbean is well established. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the archive is well known. Historians have used this archive for 300 years. There's a, an enormous amount of documentation that sets out the specific characteristics and the functions of the system of slavery and what it did to the African people and the native Caribbean community. The damage that has been done to these people is impatient of debate. I mean, one doesn't have to debate. That is, mm. that is quite evident. The issue of the, the descendants of the victims right. is, is one that is also established. That is, you, you establish that the present conditions that you are faced with are the direct causal reactions to the structure of the crime itself. 
when we look at the state of, of African peoples in the Caribbean, and we, we look at how Britain has left this region after 300 years of rule, mm. and if you, if you want to take the Jamaica case, which was their largest market, Britain captured Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655 and built the most profitable slave economy in their Caribbean world. Right. They gave Jamaica their independence in 1962. So after 300 years, how did they leave Jamaica? They left Jamaica with 80% of the people illiterate. Right. They left Jamaica with an estate where the vast majority of people were suffering from chronic diseases that all of us now are concerned about because it's galloping. The hypertension, yeah, the diabetes, hypertension and diabetes. It, it's ripping through the right. Caribbean people as a result of this history of stress, of poverty, the malnutrition, the overwork. And it has left Caribbean people in a state of disrepair. So what you do, you look at the wealth that was extracted from the region. You look at the wealth that was extracted from the laboring people. And then you look at the condition under which they have to suffer. The majority of Jamaican peoples at independence were living in this terrible ghettoized environment. Mm -hmm. They were a people who had been so subjected. And Jamaica is today trying to get out from under the burden of this history of slavery. And all of the problems that we see in Jamaica today on the streets and the communities, the, the challenges. So you're saying that that is a direct linked, effect. Yes. It's linked into what took place well, 300 years ago. Well, well of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it, the, the connection between that reality where you, you enslave people, then you legally abolish slavery, and then you establish an apartheid system with all of the racial parameters involved. You cannot live here. You cannot live there. You're not yes. entitled to this or that. Right. And then you take them through another 100 years of that. And after 400 years, the people have found themselves in a situation where they're told, now go and develop your economy and build your society and build your nation. And you walk away. What international law says very, very clearly is that these crimes must be addressed. And you have a responsibility to help to repair the damage you've so done. So reparations is about leveling the playing field. Is that, is, is that what it is? You know, is that something that is underpinning the act? The Reparations act? is about the acknowledgement that you have committed a crime and that you are prepared in all decency and all ethical formations to assist with repairing the damage that you have caused. It calls for you to take the high moral ground, admit that you have committed offenses that have had consequences, mm -hmm. and that you are prepared as a civilization to help those victims to uplift themselves to a reasonable condition. That is what reparations is, to repair the damage that you have caused. Now, many countries uh, that are weak, nations that are weak, are never able to press a reparations claim. Because those who committed the offenses can very well say to you, we have nothing to say to you. Go away. Yes. We, we're not going to answer your charges. We, we're not going to listen to your plea. Go away. So your nation has to be sufficiently organized to say, we will discuss this matter. It must be discussed. It is not about confrontation. It is not about conflict. We are asking you in all reasonableness to come and help us right. to repair the damage that you have caused. We will take our share of the responsibility for repairing the damage, for uplifting the people. But you also have to come and join with us to collaboratively prepare a strategy to uplift these people. Yes. That's what but, it does. But first, there has to be an admission. But Correct. We're at the end of our first segment. And uh, when we come back to the second segment, I want us to look at you know, some of the atrocities that was practiced, committed during the, 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 the period of slavery, so that we can contextualize what it is we're talking about when we say people have been disenfranchised. OK, so let's, let's pick that up when we come back to the second segment. This is Unrendered. My guest on this edition is Professor Hilary Beckles. More when we come back.